Before I say introduce our speaker tonight, I'd just like to say the credit crunch has obviously focused our minds on the key part the financial system plays in our global economy, and in particular the plight of the UK political economy has highlighted the, case, the way in which our own government, I'm sorry to say, depends on the machinations of the City of London. But these are not only volatile and corrupt, they're also extremely opaque. And it's precisely this lack of transparency that makes it so difficult for ordinary citizens to understand what's going on, and as a result for us to know what on earth to do about it, really. And this is why it gives me such special pleasure to introduce John Christensen to us tonight, because he's been working tirelessly now for nearly a decade to lift this veil of secrecy and show us what lies underneath. <laughs> John is a development economist by training, and he's been an economic advisor to the UK and the Jersey governments. But his experiences in the world of finance so appalled him, John, <laughs> that he decided to turn all his alarmingly formidable energies towards establishing the Tax Justice Network. Um, as you probably know, or maybe you don't, the TJN essentially promotes transparency in international finance and opposes secrecy. Anyway, the, the TJN was launched in the House of Parliament in 2003, and since it really has gone absolutely from strength to strength, and it's now a very powerful international network operating at national, regional, and global levels, and it's got members and bases in a wide range of countries in Africa and Europe and Australia and the US. It has unearthed a huge amount of embarrassing information and produced many reports, one of which is here, which was that there are some three copies on the table which were produced with Action Aid very recently, how international tax moves keep people poor. Um, it's become a really famous thorn in the flesh of those who profit from institutionalized corruption. And I have to say that when I first met John and found out what the then infant TJN was up to, I was seriously afraid he would fall foul of one of those mysterious accidents that sometimes befall people who know too much. I'm not joking, actually, about that either. But anyway, here he is, still is, thank goodness, continuing to create mayhem among the mighty. And the TJN's latest project, the production of a financial secrecy index, has certainly done that. Um, it's disclosed the leading economic centers, including the US, the UK, and Singapore, are among the countries most to blame for promoting international financial secrecy. And this index has just launched all over Europe, and here, and in the US, and it's had very wide publicity, as those of you who read the FT will probably have noticed. Anyway, forgive me for going on so long when you really want to be listening to John, but as those of you who come here have probably noticed before, I think the TJN is one of the most remarkable and influential shaker and mover organizations around. I really do. And I just couldn't resist this golden opportunity to say so. So here is its director to shake and move you all, and I have great pleasure in handing over to John. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me back. Um, Last time I was here was pre-crisis, um, and we were talking about uh, an imminent crisis, a crisis building up, and here we are now living through it. Just a quick word about my background. I am a development economist. In my early 20s, I worked with Oxfam. Oxfam was looking at um, financial matters, global financial architecture, to use our jargon, uh, and um, we all knew something was going badly wrong in the late 1970s and early 1980s. We were particularly distrustful of the financial market liberalization program being pushed by Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, and we were very concerned about the impact on developing countries because we knew that this would lead to massive capital outflows from developing countries. And without those capital outflows, they would not be able to fund their own development. They would become more reliant upon external debt um, they would become more reliant upon external aid. All of these things did happen. Um, the financial market liberalization was imposed upon most developing countries, and lo and behold, their capital disappeared overseas, not by the hundreds of millions, but by the hundreds of billions. The latest estimate, to give you some idea of where th things stand at the moment, and this is a an estimate produced earlier this year by our partners in Washington is that developing countries are losing something between 800 
billion dollars to one trillion point zero six one point zero six trillion dollars every year through illicit financial circuits and it was that world that I decided to go and explore because back in the early 1980s none of us knew very much about the financial markets and how they were set up um, we all were pretty naive about this but I had one advantage I come from the island of Jersey and it was very easy for me to go inside as an insider into the financial system in Jersey I work there initially in an accounting firm called Deloitte Touche in those days Touche Ross um, working on the inside um, and so and I'll tell you a bit about my experience in that in a few minutes time but um, I moved from being essentially a, a specialist in microcredit in the late 1970s to looking more widely at financial capitalism and how financial capitalism was adapting to this brave new world of deregulated financial markets that Mrs. Thatcher kicked off in 1979. And what I, what I discovered in my own explorations and through meeting a lot of people along the way was that we in Britain sit at the center of a particularly toxic, a particularly dangerous, a particularly deregulated and harmful financial economy. Um, and Britain carries a particular responsibility for it. It predates Mrs. Thatcher. We mustn't pin all the blame on Mrs. Thatcher. It actually goes back um, to the 1950s when Britain was going through a, a severe process of industrial decline. It was hopelessly undercapitalized. Bretton Woods had pretty much, the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement, had pretty much constrained the City of London from doing what it used to do beforehand, which was basically, essentially, to loot the former British Empire of its capital. But Bretton Woods put in place a whole system of exchange control and capital control mechanisms, which made it very much more difficult for the City of London to act in that way. But in 1958, something very interesting happened. That is, the Bank of England decided to turn a blind eye to the emergence of a market which most of us have heard of, we recognize the name, but none of us understand, at least I suspect none of us understand. Originally it was called the petrodollar market, then it was called the euro dollar market, then it became the euro market. Um, it's, by any name, it's, it's, any of those names are misleading, because actually that market which began here in London in 1958, triggered off by a bond issue by Midland Bank, was the start of a totally deregulated financial system, completely offshore. Um, and that's in some respects where the Queen, when she asked this question at the London School of Economics earlier this year about the financial crisis, that's where perhaps one would start. We're looking now at the at probably the worst banking crisis and financial market crisis, not since the 1930s, but since the 1870 financial market crisis. This is a much deeper financial crisis than the 1930s um, market. Virtually every single model has collapsed. Here in Britain, we've seen a transfer of something of the order of one trillion. Now, a trillion is 1,000 billion or one million million pounds from taxpayers, that is from normal people like you and me, to the banks and their shareholders. This is probably the biggest transfer of wealth in this country. I've been talking to economic historians about this since the Norman Conquest. I kid you not, when the Normans came and took over all the land from the Anglo-Saxons and others who were there beforehand, that was the, the gigantic wealth grab. We have not seen a wealth grab on this scale since that time. Um, what has happened since then is that the opportunity that we had here in Britain to completely restructure our, our financial markets, to create financial markets that are more conducive to the, the development, long-term development of Britain, have been passed by. We could have taken the nationalized banks, mutualized the elements that were previously building societies, broken them up into much smaller elements, taken Barclays under control, taken as his investment wing, which is one of the most corrosive of all of the banks in the world. I have a particular 
uh, filling for Barclays Bank partly because of their very, very venal activities in developing countries and tried to remodel our financial system along the lines of um, the German financial system, which is much more locally based, which has a much stronger, through its Raffaisen banking system, which was what I was studying for my PhD, a much stronger focus on long-term engagement with their, their industrial partners um, at a local level. But no, we've passed by on that. Worse than that, in typical New Labour fashion, we've had a number of inquiries into what's, what went wrong. Now, those of you with long memories will know that when something crashed in Britain, we used to commission royal commissions of inquiry to look into it. I mean, Harold Wilson, for example, had a royal commission of inquiry into uh, the, the uh, banking crisis in the 1960s and the, the position of Britain in the 1960s. The Radcliffe government uh, royal commission of inquiry. The advantage of these royal commissions of inquiries lay in the fact that although they took a long time, they were very thorough, they engaged with a very wide stakeholder uh, community, they allowed for and, for and encouraged dissent. They purposefully wanted to, to look at the problems from a wide variety of issues. What did we do this time? Well, first of all, we commissioned Sir Wynne Bischoff, the failed chairman of failed Citigroup, to produce a report in which he consulted only on insiders, no outsiders, outsiders were involved at all. Um, and his report, as one can well imagine, came forward saying how important the City of London was to the British economy and how important it was that we fostered it. The same from the Wigley report. Wigley was the, is the chief executive of uh, um, Merrill Lynch uh, and needless to say, he did exactly the same process. He consulted only with insiders and came up with a predictably um, uh, narrow report which really didn't take anyone any further forward. The third report I'd like to focus on is a report close to, to my area of interest, um, uh, Michael Foote. So Michael Foote was commissioned to produce a report upon the British relationship with the Crown dependencies and its overseas territories and, and with tax havens in general. Uh, and, and Michael Foote did the usual he consulted. He did consult with civil society and he did come up with some minor recommendations, but he didn't ask the big questions. How very typically British. Um, so I think it's time that we opened up a national dialogue to ask some searching questions about Britain's development strategy because since, particularly since the late 1970s, we have had a, a development strategy which has been almost entirely focused upon developing the interests of what we call financial capitalism um, and it, largely ignoring the interests of industrial capitalism. In other words, ignore manufacturing that's old hat, we want to move to a brave new economy and the City of London will be the leader of this um, brave new economy. Um, it, 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 it began, as I said, in the 1950s, but, but Mrs Thatcher really kicked it off in 1986 with Big Bang, which led to a massive deregulation of financial services and allowed for the banks to, um, to uh, concentrate their activities merge what was previously completely separate activity, retail banking activity, investment banking activity. The idea being to make Britain the predominant financial centre, London in particular, the predominant financial centre in the world, which it now is. But I think we must now start seriously questioning, first of all, whether having a predominant financial sector is a good thing for the public interest in Britain, I argue very much that it is not. But also we must now start arguing about whether, looking very carefully at Britain's role in harming the rest of the world. Because if, getting back to Her Majesty's question, we look very deeply into this financial crisis, you'll see that it wasn't caused suddenly by the collapse of the housing market bubble um, in the United States, which is the story that so many people have been repeating. <coughs> It was caused by a much, much deeper malaise running right the way through the financial system. A complexity, an opacity, which is being driven by, by a combination of factors which we in Britain have been largely responsible for taking the lead on. Those combination of factors, the combination of factors are, first of all, financial market deregulation, which makes it very much more profitable to, for banks to operate. And secondly, tax avoidance. The vast majority 
of the financial engineering and financial innovation which you read about in the, the national press and in the international press is actually being driven by a combination of those two factors. And that is where Britain has led the world. That's the world I want to talk, us, talk to you about now. Um, but I also want to talk to you a bit about the City of London, because earlier, the last, well, earlier this year, beginning of, beginning of the year, I made a documentary with a French team about the City of London. And I started to explain to them about the City of London and its relationship with the UK state. And when you look at the relationship between the UK state, you see it really is the most extraordinary situation. Actually, since before the Norman Conquest, the City of London was granted a whole host of government, political prerogatives, powers, which William the Conqueror allowed them to carry forward. And that was subsequently ratified by one king after another and built into statutes. And here we have a genuine state within the state. To all intents and purposes, London is a separate state, a city state in the true sense of that term, operating within the broader UK economy. But it's a city-state with such extraordinary powers that it is able to determine Britain's political agenda to a very large extent. And this is the real problem that we have. Because politically, as the title of this talk indicates, we have for decades, in fact for centuries, had a relationship between our government, Whitehall, and the City of London, which has been one of capitulation, capitulation, and capitulation. And that basically describes the relationship between New Labour and the City of London. In fact, they capitulated before they even came to power. For those of you who remember John Smith's prawn cocktail offensive, and those with a sense of humour will remember Michael Heseltine saying, never have so many crustacea died in vain, and he was correct. City of London caused such havoc to the preceding Labour governments that John Smith and his, subs and his successor, Tony Blair, was determined to come to an accommodation with the City of London. And the result was that they have accommodated the City of London in, on virtually everything the City of London has required. And this has actually made the situation much, much worse. That's what I intend to explore. But first of all, to answer Her Majesty's concerns up to a point, I wanted to explore the culture that we have now in Britain, which is the culture that we were looking at through this French documentary. Because when the financial market collapsed, beginning with Northern Rock, it appeared to come as a shock to many, many people. But I can tell you, within the city, and I spend a lot of time working and talking with people in the city, most people had been expecting it for two or three years. Therefore, why had it not been signed up earlier? What were the failures? Well, the failure, I think, is that here in Britain, we have, a, we have developed a culture, and it goes back to Mrs. Thatcher's time, where we stifle dissent. We do not encourage genuine political debate any longer. Tony Blair was particularly bad about that. His legacy within New Labour was to stifle any debate happening, with, happening within the progressive movement. So the failures that we saw, and people have blamed all sorts of things. Above all, we tended to blame um, the, the banking directors and the, the, the um, uh, credit rating agencies. But actually, I think that what we've seen is a much more systemic failure right the way across the board, right the way through the financial establishment. Non-executive board members who didn't challenge at the right time. Remuneration boards who put into place remuneration systems which which encouraged short-termism and did and discouraged, actively discouraged, people who took a dissenting view. Risk managers who were stifled at every attempt, and it wasn't just HBOS who, who, where they had the system, we don't want to hear about the risks because we are all about short-term immediate gains. It gets worse, external auditors who failed to do the job because they had conflicts of interest because the same companies, that is the external audit company divisions of KPMG were providing the advice, the consulting company, exciting consulting advice to the same companies and there were conflicts of interest within, within their audit systems. The credit rating agencies we all know about, their, their failures, but the, the regulatory authorities. Now, 
from 2003, 2004, we were meeting regularly with the Financial Reporting Council and the Financial Services Authority, talking about our concerns. And we weren't exceptional in this respect. I know other people were raising exactly the same concerns. They were proud of their light touch regulation. And they said the whole strength of the City of London lies with our light touch regulation and the fact that we have a, a fantastic capacity within the City of London to understand risk. All one can say is, ha! The fund managers who didn't want to question it because they themselves were driving on a profit maximizing goal themselves and they didn't want to challenge it because they were referencing themselves against other fund managers. The politicians who ignored public interest in this thinking that uh, as long as it didn't happen on their watch, the whole, whole thing would go away. The financial and economic journalists who for years <coughs> were talking the language of collateralized debt obligations, securitized debt, mezzanine debt, without understanding for one second what these things meant and without explaining to the public what these things, what risks these involved. The academic and professional economists who themselves didn't understand what was going on but had, for the, in many, many, so many cases have become conflicted because their seats are now paid for, their professorships are now sponsored out of the city of London the think tanks and the faith movements. This was a comprehensive failure to understand what was going on and not to ask the right questions. So I think in looking at this, we, we have a much deeper malaise running through our financial system and, our, our, uh, and financial capitalism in Britain. Um, and, and, and this is what we were trying to, to tease out through this French documentary. How have we arrived at this situation? I don't have the answers, by the way. But it runs very deep indeed. This character, Alan Greenspan, who everyone now likes to flag up as the real villain of the piece, and I think he was the real villain of the piece, he based his, all of his, his thinking on an economic theory called the efficient market hypothesis. That is that markets are inherently efficient and will always arrive at, an, at, 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 at the correct equilibrium. He now, of course, famously earlier this year, reneged on that view. But what I found extraordinary about Alan Greenspan and all of the people here is that they preach this faith of free markets. And it is a faith. It's not a science. Economics is... There's an awful lot of faith and, frankly, metaphysics in economics. Um, you, you only have to start talking about the invisible hand to realize that we're talking metaphysics. We're not talking about anything scientific here. The famous thing about the invisible hand of economics is it remains invisible. No one has actually seen it. It's a famous gag. Um, but they placed all of their faith in the idea that free, unregulated markets would serve public interest. And this was, this was the only way of serving public interest. But at the root of their theory lies the idea that you must have complete and comprehensive transparency. Markets can only work efficiently when they are transparent. And the reality, when you start working in the City of London, is that markets are anything but transparent. Huge amounts of very important information are withheld from the most important stakeholders. And I want to talk about that in a few minutes' time. I'm going to get, going to get into that, because I'm going to start talking about London's role in creating the, the mayhem that blew apart two years ago. But getting back to Her Majesty's question about how come nobody foresaw it, there were, in fact, a lot of people who were, who did foresee it. Not least John Plender from the Financial Times, who in a series of articles in 2004 started speaking about this, started looking at the markets, and came to this, this, this conclusion, a conclusion which I totally concur with, that the whole culture of Anglo-American finance is increasingly subversive of regulation, taxation, and democratic values even when it remains within the law. And that is the, probably the, one of the best descriptions I've come across of the, of the City of London and the way it operates. Another person who's come round to our way of thinking recently is Lord Adair Turner, who earlier this year had the misfortune to take over the Financial <coughs> Services Authority, and who famously has said that the City of London had grown way beyond a socially reasonable size, 
Guns for far too much of national output and is sucking in far too many of Britain's brightest graduates. Absolutely. I think, he says, some of, it's so, some of it is socially useless activity. The financial sector has swollen beyond its socially useful size and seems to make excessively large profits. Fixed income securities, trading derivatives and hedging are areas that have grown beyond socially optimal levels. Fund management and share trading might also have grown too big. Needless to say, he has been vilified by the City of London for this kind of heresy. Um, and it takes a lot of courage for anybody who's worked within the City of London to talk at all um, along lines like this. Another person who shockingly, uh, who, has, who has shocked the city, is Mervyn King, governor of the Bank of England. In a series of speeches this autumn, this, this comes from a speech he gave a couple of weeks ago in Edinburgh. He talked about the UK facing two fundamental challenges. One is to rebalance the economy with more resources allocated to business investment and net exports and fewer to consumption. What he was saying there, by the way, is we need to switch away from financial capitalism and more towards an industrial capitalism model with more focus upon, upon pr actual productive activity. And second, we need to structure, uh, the, we need to tackle the, uh, the structure and regulation of banking in, in the United Kingdom, which he says needs fundamental reform. Again, this is an extraordinary heresy. He is breaking away from the idea that the markets left to themselves will, will arrive at the optimal position for Britain. He's saying, we must now find ourselves a new development strategy. Just to add to the other people who along the way have suddenly found um, a new, uh, broken away from the orthodoxy, Paul Volcker, the former chair of the US Federal Reserve, speaking last year at the Economic Club in New York, said, the sheer complexity, the opaqueness, and the systemic risks embedded in the new markets, the complexity of risks which were little understood even by those with management responsibilities, have enormously complicated both official and private responses to this current mother of all crisis. Simply stated, the bright new financial system for all its talented participants, for all its rich rewards, has failed the test of the marketplace. In other words, the model that was adapted, that, that is the British development model of focusing upon developing in financial capitalism, London as a centre of excellence, has proven to be utterly broken. And I think we must make that point and reiterate that because there are those, and here's one of the villains in the pack, who says, and this is Richard Lambert, the uh, chief executive of the Confederation of Business Industry, who says that the job must be to put Humpty Dumpty back together again as quickly as possible at an damn the expense. And by the way, we must continue with the previous development strategy. And that strategy was to, in his words, to create a competitive tax and regulatory regime uh, which will be an essential component of our future success. Let's just explore what he means by that. Because I had a head-on with the CBI on the Today programme earlier this year. Because they were saying it's absolutely essential the City of London remains competitive. It is the jewel in the crown. And I said, great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, great. If they want to be competitive, why don't you talk to the, your members and tell them that the way of competing in a global market is, is not by getting subsidies through lower tax rates and by deregulating, which causes this absolute mayhem. If you really want to compete in the low global markets, why don't you lower your fees, which are the highest fees in the world? Why don't you cut your costs? Why don't you cut back on the freebies and the junkets and the bonuses? That's the way you compete. In the industrial capitalism in which I trained, because I trained in industry before going into many, many years back, we competed by producing good products at the right price. We didn't compete by getting government subsidies and deregulating the markets. But somehow, when we talk about the City of London, in order to remain competitive at a global level, we have to give them tax subsidies, tax breaks. We have to allow for non-DOMs, that is, very, very wealthy people who come here and pay no tax at all. We have to allow massive tax breaks for the employees who work in the City of London so they're able to claim their bonuses offshore in all sorts of... Uh, different ways. We have to al allow for hedge funds to operate in London but be taxed in the, city, in the Channel Islands. This is the reality of what's happening now. In other words, we must create a competitive tax and regulatory environment in which we subsidise the City of London at the expense of the rest of us. But then when the City of London goes bankrupt, the rest of us have to pay. <laughs> 
So that's the rant that I had with Richard Lambert and his mob. And that's essentially been our development strategy because what Mrs. Thatcher did, starting in the early 1980s, but particularly after 1986 with Big Bang, was to create a totally deregulated financial system. And um, just getting back to Her Majesty's question, the people who foresaw it, we, and here's the observer <laughs> very kindly commenting it, when we created the Tax Justice Network, we weren't just looking at tax evasion and tax avoidance and tax competition issues. We were looking very much more deeply into the financial system and talking about how Britain's development strategy in deregulating the markets had created what sociologists call a criminogenic market. That is a market which encourages criminal activity. What do we mean by that? Well, as soon as you start creating very secretive mar markets, particularly in financial services, you start opening up the opportunities for fraud at lots of different levels. Embezzlement, tax evasion, market rigging, a whole host of other frauds. As I said, particularly when you have globalized markets, you need to have transparency. If you don't have transparency, then people could set up very, very opaque structures in which all sorts of shenanigans and monkey business become not just possible, but the norm. Think Enron. Enron, which in 1999 was presented, I was at a, at a conference here in London, where one legal firm and accounting firm and banking firm after another stood up and said, Enron is the financial model for capitalism in the 21st century. I wish I'd filmed it, it would be wonderful. It's one of those conferences which cost about two and a half thousand pounds for a day's conference. Not normal people don't attend them, but I had a press pass, pass at that stage so I could get in. And there they were saying that Enron was the financial model. Now Enron was actually one gigantic pack of cards where all of their liabilities, as you know, were located offshore in special purpose vehicles which appeared not to be, well, they were all off balance sheet, they weren't recorded on, on anyone's balance sheet, so nobody knew about them. So they managed to perpetuate a gigantic financial scam for several years because nobody understood what was going on because everything was very complex and everything was very opaque. That was what concerned us and this is, that was why when we created the Tax Justice Network, we started to lay out a platform for tackling what we call the engines of chaos. The tax havens, you call them. We call them secrecy jurisdictions. Because secrecy jurisdictions now lie at the heart of financial capitalism. Virtually all of cross-border investment is rooted through these places. Um, we don't have proper figures because the World Bank and the IMF in their wisdom don't actually collect statistics about this but the, the statistic produced by the Bank of England in the late 1990s said that over 90% of cross-border investment is rooted through tax havens. If we look at trade figures again we don't have any reliable statistics for how much trade is rooted on paper through tax havens but the best estimate, again, produced a long time ago by the British government, by the Department for International Development, suggests that at least half of world trade is rooted through tax havens. At least a third of private wealth is held in these tax havens. In other words, they are not small parts. They are very major parts of the global economy. And yet there is no information available about them whatsoever. We know that all, virtually all, illicit financial flows, running to trillions every year, go through complex multi-jurisdiction structures using offshore companies, offshore trusts, offshore foundations, protected cell companies, all of them located in these places. We know that secrecy jurisdictions are used extensively for, for trade mispricing uh, and that the global rules for trade pricing have comprehensively failed particularly rules relating to intellectual property rights, because there are no rules relating to intellectual property rights. We know that they have been used to promote tax competition, enabling multinational companies to locate their 
intellectual property rights offshore, and that tax competition has created massive distortions in the global trade and investment things, and have put mass small and medium enterprise enterprises at a massive competitive disadvantage. This is not disputed. We know that offshore financial centers have been used to create and to exploit the regulatory gaps. And I'll give you an example of this. In 2004, we went to meet the Financial Services Authority, we being a team including Professor Prem Sika, Austin Mitchell and myself and a couple of others. And we were talking about securitized debt and saying there are a lot of unknown risks. It wasn't because we were clever, we'd been told about this for a long time. This did not suddenly occur when some people stopped, stopped pay, paying their mortgages in Midwest America. This had been building up for a very long time, trust me on that. But, and we said, look, many of these security, securitized debt instruments are being um, marketed through London, but they're being issued out of the Channel Islands because there are law firms in the Channel Islands that specialize in issuing virtually all securitized debt instruments. And we said, we think you should be looking at this. And they said, well, we have no jurisdiction in the Channel Islands. We said, well, we've spoken to the Channel Islands authorities and they're not interested in this at all. And this is a risk that affects British banks and British people. And they said, well, we have no jurisdiction uh, and therefore there's not a lot we can do about it. Well, first of all, that isn't correct. Technically, the UK government is responsible for the governance of the Crown dependencies. But more important, what this revealed was that British financial capitalism has, for many decades, purposefully set itself up using British overseas territories and crown dependencies for the vast majority of its international operations, precisely because there are regulatory gaps there that they could exploit. And the British government has, for decades, turned a blind eye to that. This is why Susanna, in the introduction, mentioned the Financial Secrecy Index, which we launched last week. And here are the top five players. This is why Britain rightly belongs in the top five. The list, as you can see, puts USA at the top. Delaware, Wyoming, Nevada are all tax havens. And the United States is one of the most opaque financial uh, countries in the world. Um, it came as a bit of a surprise to them to find themselves listed there, but anyway, they deserve the position. Luxembourg, Switzerland, Cayman Islands, and the United Kingdom, City of London. The L London is the world's largest offshore financial centre. Technically, actually, it is a lot less secret than Switzerland and Luxembourg, but the scale of operation is absolutely enormous. If we look at the scale of operation, London has approximately 20% of the global cross-border financial services activity. This is a, a figure we pulled out. Um, Chris, I've been working with Christian A. They were co-sponsors of that index. Um, the City of London itself accounts for 19.7% of total global cross-border financial services. In other words, it is by far the biggest player. USA comes next, Luxembourg, blah, blah, blah. They can see it. But if you add to that figure London's satellites, it's satellites sitting across the world, and I'll show you those satellites in a few minutes, in a few seconds' time. London actually has almost one third of the global market. That's how big London is in terms of its global financial services. Now, we have been arguing, we here being the Tax Justice Network and a professional organization that I I'm a member of called the Association of Accountancy and Business Affairs. That sounds a really boring organization, but actually it's a very radical and brilliant organization. We chose a boring title because if you have a radical name, then you don't get BBC coverage. But with a, <laughs> an ex a boring name like Association of Accountancy and Business Affairs, you sound like you know, a proper person. Um, we've been pushing the International Monetary Fund for a very, very long time to recognize that opacity and regulatory gaps and tax subsidies are a very major part, a very ma deeply rooted in the financial crisis. Because what's happened over the last 30 to 40 years is that industrial capitalism has re-engineered itself 
largely around the opportunities to operate in a deregulated environment, in other words, London and its offshore satellites, and to maximize the opportunity for tax avoidance, because tax avoidance gives them a massive profit advantage, um, and it's an easy profit advantage over their rivals. And having gained that profit advantage, particularly against national rivals, they're then in a position to outcompete them, not by offering better services or lower prices, but quite simply by having this unfair tax competition advantage. Very harmful. The IMF, until this year, has largely ignored it. But earlier this year, they produced a report available on the web, Debt Bias and Other Distortions, Crisis-Related Issues in Tax Policy, which basically could have been written by the Tax Justice Network. It talked about the way in which corporate-level tax, tax biases favor debt finance. We've seen massive leverage. Uh, you know, we, we, we know how much debt, excess liquidity, uh, and debt has fueled the current crisis. Why has there been such a focus on debt? Because actually we subsidize debt. Equity capital is taxed, debt is totally untaxed. Why? Why are we subsidizing debt in this way? It's obviously going to be a massive distortion within the world economy. Secondly, we give all sorts of favorable treatments. For example, in the United States, they still have mortgage interest uh, debt re uh, tax relief, which, which wrongly, they think, enables first-time buyers to buy property but actually leads directly into house price inflation and capitalization of the value of that, that debt, uh, that mortgage interest debt relief uh, or tax treatment, it actually helps to stimulate property price bubbles. When you look at the majority of the financial innovation which city, the City of London specializes in, particularly securitized debt instruments, you will find that they are often driven, in fact, typically driven by the combination of tax avoidance and regulatory arbitrage, particularly around the favorable treatment of capital gains. And this is one of New Labour's biggest failures because one of the earliest things they did was to shift the capital gains tax rate in Britain, which was on parity with income tax and should be on parity with income tax, and dropped it significantly, making it very much more favorable for, for people like hedge fund operators and private equity funds to develop their strategies around capital gain, angling for capital gains on speculative movements rather than long-term investment which yields profits which are taxed on an income basis. The problem, as the IMF recognized, is that these tax avoidance things, particularly around debt instruments, amplify the economic impact right the way, th right the way through the process. And this is something that is, is, has yet to be fully researched. Um, and to continue, the recent progress on tax havens does not address the fundamental problems of tax avoidance and the way in which so many of the banks have op structured all of their investment and, uh, 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 and particularly what's called structured finance investment around tax avoidance um, issues. So we discover that the International Monetary Fund has finally recognized the extent to which these anomalies in the globalized financial markets have actually been driving the way that financial capitalism has structured itself over the last 20 years. Now, I say the last 20 years, I think we need to go back a lot longer. This summer, I've been working I'm researching a book, and I've been going back into the British, into the archives, um, into the public record office, to look at Britain's development strategy to find out how far back it goes. I wanted to go back beyond the Macmillan government, in fact, into the late 1950s, and to find out what governments were, were doing at this stage when the City of London really was in a state of what, what appeared to be terminal decline. In particular, we wanted to find out why the British government the Bank of England turned a blind eye in 1958 to the development of this totally deregulated market sitting outside the Bretton Woods system, which was triggered by the issue of a bond by Barclays Bank. And what 
what we've discovered is a fascinating trail of British government officials raising the alarm bells at every possible opportunity. Here's one, a, a colonial office official sitting in the Bahamas saying, in very civil service speak, we are deeply concerned by the financial wizards that are working here out of the Bahamas. We see similar things happening in Bermuda, but it is quite clear that these people are getting up to all sorts of shenanigans, not only to break the exchange, Britain's, Sterling's exchange control things, but all sorts of other illegal market rigging activities. Uh, and, we, and, and of course, at that stage, the Bahamas and Bermuda and most of these places had no regulation whatsoever. Dig deeper, oh, by the way, this is the Financial Times, sorry, the Sunday Times article, which we dug up, dated 23rd, 1969, uh, 23rd February, 1969. What's fascinating about this article was it was actually pinned, the only newspaper article pinned in a Treasury report, and it was quite clear, it was pinned there to alert us to the fact that there was pressure coming from the City of London to turn the City of London into a tax haven. Uh, and here it is laid out by the then financial editor of the Sunday Times, saying what we now need to do as our development strategy is to, is to largely deregulate large areas of activity of the City of London um, and give them a whole host of tax advantages to encourage capital into Britain. From a secret Bank of England report, which was declassified earlier this year. Um, our feeling now is that the potential gaps in the exchange control hedge can no longer be contained by occasional visits. In other words, they were flagging up the Bank of England's exchange control thing was collapsing as a result of activities out there. The smaller, less sophisticated and remote islands are receiving almost con constant attention and blandishments from expatriate operators who aspire to turn them into their own private empire, which is exactly what happened in a place called British Honduras now called Belize, now the private empire of a certain financier of the Conservative Party, whose name we cannot mention for fear of libel suits. But one of the... <laughs> we can't mention Lord Ashcroft, can we? But one of the things that fascinated me about this particular memorandum was this quote. We need, therefore, to be quite sure that the possible proliferation of trust companies banks, etc., which in most cases we know more than brass plates manipulating assets outside the islands, does not get out of hand. Now, of course, there they're saying, they're admitting that, of course, nothing actually happens in the islands. It all happens out of London. These are basically offshore satellites of London. It is London that does all the activity using these places to operate outside the regulatory controls of then the Bank of England. But then it's the next line that I love. There is, of course, no objection to their providing bolt holes for non-residents. <laughs> In other words, anyone outside the Stirling area can get up to doing whatever the hell they want. We don't mind if this wrecks Latin America, or indeed the dollar area, or our continental cousins. And then getting back to uh, the Financial Secrecy Index, which we published, here are the 60 jurisdictions that we have mapped out. Um, and you'll see that um, a lot of them are the small islands in the sun that you think of when you think of tax havens and all the little places up in the, in the Swiss Alps. But there are some big players there as well. The United States, United Kingdom, Switzerland, Netherlands, Luxembourg. But exactly one half, and they're the one half that are flagged up there, highlighted in yellow, exactly one half of those 60, 30 out of 60, are very closely politically linked to Britain, either because they're overseas territories or because they're crown dependencies, or because they're members of the Commonwealth, <coughs> the former British Empire. And I'm being kind because you'll notice, for example, that Hong Kong is not flagged up there, even though Hong Kong is very largely a creation of the City of London, sitting offshore. Likewise, Ireland, would you believe? Another, Dublin is essentially an offshoot of the City of London in the way it operates. So this is very, very deeply embedded in our development model. These places act as conduits for capital from the rest of the world headed towards the city of London. Ask any anti-money laundering specialist and they will agree that London is the final destination of choice for all criminal money. That's where it wants to end up because of the secrecy that London offers. But it is the, it is the final destination where you can mix your money into the mainstream.
financial markets. This is Yves Jolie, the head of the development committee of the European Parliament. Close colleague and friend of mine, she's a French examination magistrate. She's originally Norwegian and she has for a long time headed the Norwegian anti-corruption uh, uh, unit, which is one of our main sponsors. She has very publicly said the city of London, that state within a state, which has never transmitted even the smallest piece of usable evidence to a foreign magistrate. When I talk with Eva, she says that she regards London as the least cooperative jurisdiction in the world. And this is very much my experience. Um, getting back to the archives, this from 1971. A bit of background to this particular report. Inland Revenue recognised that they were losing tens of millions of revenue in the 1960s. In the 1960s, for those of you with long memories, a million actually meant something. So to lose tens of millions of the government budget was a very significant sum. They were anxious to claw it back. They called in the UK Treasury and said, will someone please cooperate for, to help us tackle this problem of tax evasion through the British overseas territories? UK Treasury, to begin with, wasn't particularly cooperative. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office was purposefully uncooperative, saying, we don't want to pick up the tab for our former colonies. Worse still, the Ministry of Overseas Development said, actually, it's a bloody good development strategy for them, and they're helping London as well. So the Overseas Development Ministry at that time was saying, we want to support the tax haven economy because it means we don't have to pay, uh, they, they won't be dependent upon our aid. But look at what is kind of highlighted here. And this kind of puts... The, nails the lie that actually it was the UK, uh, the US administration that was pushing this process. Quite the opposite. The US administration was pushing in exactly the opposite way. They were, try they were very anti United Kingdom's development strategy of deregulating financial capitalism and using tax havens to attract capital out of the South. Also France, which had, and this is a word I'm not particularly uh, conversant with, animadverted on the prevalence of paradis fiscaux as yet another undesirable feature of the St Stirling area. That was in 1971. So this has a long history of Britain working against the interests of our so-called OECD allies and working against their agenda. This report was published, well it wasn't published, this report was completed in 1971, never saw the light of day, was never acted upon, but the Treasury said in this report, we must urgently act against tax havens and against deregulation of the City of London because it will eventually lead to disastrous crises within the financial system. That's how far back this goes. They were flagging it up. Anyway, a very quick shift away to what I discovered when I set out to start exploring this. And I, my, I came into this, as I said earlier, from working with Oxfam, and I was working with Oxfam actually on microcredit and cooperatives. And I was working, in, of all places, Malaysia, on preparing a law draftsman's brief to prepare a new cooperative development law to encourage the growth of microcredit and credit, credit unions in Malaysia, because they were still using the old colonial model. And whilst I was working there, some, some of my co-researchers at the... Um, Ministry of Rural Development came to me and said, look, there is a major, major problem within the cooperative sector. It's a political problem. And what's happened is that we have allowed the creation of what are called, are called deposit-taking cooperatives. And I said, hello, what's that? Well, it's not really a cooperative. It's an open-ended unit trust. In other words, an investment vehicle taking deposits from widows and orphans and all the rest, from the general public, in other words, but it's operating through the cooperative system because it's, by doing this, it can be totally unregulated. And it's been, the, most of these have been set up with very close ties to political parties, and therefore no one is doing anything about it. But we know that massive fraud is happening. Now, um, for reasons which escape me now, I decided that we'd look into this. And I spoke to the central bank there, and I spoke to others, I spoke to the registrar of cooperatives, and they all said, Look, we know this is happening. We know we're concerned about it, but there's nothing we can do about it. And we don't want to touch it because it's got high level political um, connections involved. So it's very political. 
Um, the more we investigated, the clearer it was that massive funds were disappearing. In fact, when eventually the whole crisis blew up, and it blew up as a result of this newspaper article which I had published in the Business Times, that is, Southeast Asia Business Times, when it blew up, um, Ernst & Young were called in to do the audit, and they reckoned that somewhere between 700 to 800 billion dollars had disappeared. And after the publication of that article in the Business Times, there was a massive run and a banking collapse. And this from the Financial Times, I don't expect you to read the whole damn lot, but you'll see 24 of those deposit-taking cooperatives simply collapsed. It was a major systemic crisis. That's all incidental because this is what triggered off my interest in capital flights and illicit financial movements out of developing countries. I decided to follow some of those money, and it took me to Singapore, to Brunei, to Hong Kong, and then it took me home to Jersey. I'm a Jerseyman. And I met a wall of total uncooperation. In fact, deliberate attempts to prevent any investigation into this, even though it was clear a massive fraud had happened. The lawyers behind the offshore companies, the lawyers behind the offshore trusts, the, bank, the regulators in Jersey quite simply put stone walls up at every single stage, even when Interpol got involved. So I decided that, and that's really what precipitated my move back to so, Susanna. It wasn't that I was, an, I was an ins uh, that I kind of was working inside the system and got disillusioned. I decided that I had to go into the system to find out what, how it worked. So I got a job there, and what I found from working on the inside and having access to client files, hundreds of client files through Deloitte and Touche, and quietly working away there with complete uh, access to all of them, was systemic insider trading, systemic market rigging, <laughs> endless avoiding disclosures of conflicts of interest, a lot of illicit arms trading, illicit political donations, contract kickbacks, bribery, fraudulent invoicing, trade mispricing, and tax evasion. This is what happens when you allow financial markets to become totally secretive. You create what sociologists call a criminogenic environment. This is what Alan Greenspan was so completely wrong about it. He thought that the financial markets were transparent. He is completely wrong. They are completely opaque. They are opaque either because of legalized secrecy arrangements or they are opaque because the structures are so complex, covering so many different jurisdictions, that it takes years of investigative forensic journalism or investigation to find out what's going on. Needless to say, it doesn't happen. That investigation doesn't happen. I'm going to come to a conclusion now because I think that I'd like to have a lot of questions about this, but it's partly this that has led to Obama and the US administration and our colleagues in America making this one of the key parts of the Obama administration's um, attempt to tackle the financial crisis. They recognize that far too much of world trade and investment and the structures of financial capitalism is hidden behind these extraordinarily secretive and opaque structures. And because of that, financial risks are able to build up, which no one can investigate, no one can analyze, no one can understand. Obama, importantly, even before he was elected, and in fact, even before he stood for the presidency, was one of the signatories to the Corporate Transparency Bill, which went back to the Senate earlier this year. He's also one of the signatories to the Stop Tax Haven Abuse Act. I believe it was Obama's pressure sometime in the very early March that led Gordon Brown to stand up in Congress and the Senate and make this statement. How much safer would everyone's savings be if the whole world finally came together to outlaw shadow banking systems and offshore tax havens? Now, believe me, Gordon Brown's team didn't expect him to say that. I know that because they called me the night after he said that and said, can you come to Downing Street and tell us what we're going to need to do and what civil society expects of us? He said that, I believe, because Obama had said, we are now going to advance a very strong agenda against financial opacity, against 
tax evasion, tax avoidance against the complexity of the system and we see Britain as a key player in this process. We now want you to join us in this fight. I, that's conjecture, I don't have that for certain. But certainly no one expected Gordon Brown to make that statement in the Senate and the Congress with his joint session when he did in March 2009, which led on to the G20 taking on this issue um, uh, when it met in, in London. But our response to what's been proposed so far is that all of the measures that are being discussed and have been discussed at G20 and within the OE Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development are frankly tinkering at the edges. They have still haven't understood the importance of this agenda. If we are to make the financial markets less volatile, less criminal, less anti-democratic in their attitude, we must urgently make them much, much more transparent so that civil society can engage and understand what's going on there. By civil society, I mean journalists, NGOs, academics, the whole range of investigators that have a legitimate interest in understanding what these people are doing with our money. The agenda that they've adopted is frankly weak, ineffective, it doesn't go nearly far enough. We now need, and this is my final message, we now need a global coalition which doesn't just do what Tax Justice Network is attempting to do, but looks much more broadly at the way in which financial markets operate, how they are regulated, and brings pressure to bear upon the governments, that is the governments of all of the OECD countries and all of the major financial centres, to make our financial markets much more transparent, to remove the distortions, tax evasion, tax avoidance, and regulatory arbitrage distortions, which have shaped financial capitalism over the last 40 years. Um, and this will not happen unless we are able to bring, up, bring together a coalition of political interests, general public coalition, that is equally powerful to the City of London. Because the City of London is, I regret to say, the state within the state that will block and has continued to block every single measure, even during the current crisis. Um, a final note about my interest in as a, a kind of external commentator looking in on this, Albert Camus certainly shaped my thinking because I did French literature at A-level and beyond, uh, and Albert Camus was my favorite writer, and he famously is, of course, a writer of the absurd. He looked at things which, were, which he regarded as intolerable, things which went against reason, things which are ludicrous. When I look in, and from a, from a very early age, when I look in to the relationship between the city of London and the United Kingdom, I regard it as absurd that we have conceded so many powers to the state within a state. We continue to concede. We continue to capitulate, capitulate, capitulate to these people even when they bankrupt us. And I think the only way of looking at them is through the prism of absurdity and saying everything that's happened in the last 18 months in response to the crisis is absurd. The crisis hasn't gone away. We haven't rectified anything at all. The situation, if anything, is a lot worse. Because now in response to the crisis, they're moving forward, a bit like Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, they're now moving forward with an even more aggressive agenda of deeper public sector cuts, more privatization, more aggressive tax competition, and more deregulation. I mean, you just couldn't make it up. On that unhappy note, <laughs> I'd welcome any questions, comments, and uh, <laughs> raspberries.